Today, we are in uh, week six of our series, At the Core of Joy. You've heard me say every week for the last uh, six weeks, five weeks, I guess, uh, today's the sixth, that we have eight core values here at Community of Joy, and all but one are two words, and they're intentionally two words so that you can remember the concepts, so that you can uh, apply them to your life, and we can apply them to the way we live here as a congregation, because core values are guiding principles that dictate our behavior. They're not words on a wall. They're not words on a website. They're supposed to guide how we behave and how we act and who we are and what we do in our community and in our world. So far, we've looked at the very first core value, which is always the first core value. It's always Jesus. And then we looked at open arms, serving hands among the broken. And last week, we looked at beloved mess. If you missed any of them, they're all online. Um, and there's a YouTube channel that we have there, and you can listen to all of them there. This week, we're at the core value, risking together. And for the most part, we as humans don't like to risk, do we? We like to play it safe. We like to tiptoe through life so we can arrive safely at death. Sad, but true. True. There was a skier who accidentally missed a turn and ended up careening off the edge of a cliff on the mountain. Halfway down, he grabbed hold of a branch that was sticking out from the cliff, and it stopped his fall. As he's hanging there, he looks up, and he looks down, and he realizes that he can't get up, and if he lets go, You know what's going to happen. He would tragically fall to the bottom. In desperation, he looks up again. And he yells to heaven, Is anyone up there? And a reply comes, Yes, I'm up here. Relieved, the skier yells again, Can you help me? The voice boomed back, Yes, I can help you. All you have to do is let go of the branch. Just trust me. Clinging tightly to the branch, he looks up and then he looks down. And with a terrified scream, he says, is anyone else up there? (laughs) You can probably identify. We don't like to let go of, um, or we don't like to take risks. We don't like to let go of known branches that are holding us from falling. Another story goes like this. During a war, a spy was captured by the opposing army and was sentenced to death. The general issuing the death sentence had an unusual procedure which he followed with, these, with those who were sentenced to be executed. Spies and other criminals were given two options at the point of their execution. They could have death by sword Or they could walk through this big black door. The man was given the choice between these two options. And after several moments, he chose death by sword. After the execution, someone asked the general what lay behind the big black door. The general replied, freedom. But they always prefer the known to the unknown. Behind the door is freedom, but few men have ever been brave enough to take that choice when given the options. And if we're honest, brothers and sisters, when it comes to taking risks, we're a lot like that. I mean, there's a few of us in here that are risk takers, but most of us prefer the known to the unknown. And we'll do something that we know every time over something that we don't know. We don't like taking risks. And that's even true in our faith, our life of faith. We don't like taking risks when it comes to following Jesus or for Jesus. We remain captivated by the easy and the known. Yet Jesus sends us out on mission for him into unknown territory. Several places we see this in the Gospels. 
one in particular that I want to spend a few moments and read is in Luke 10, verses 1 and following. Jesus is gathering his disciples, and this is one of several times that we see him do this. He chose 72 uh, of his disciples, and he sent them out ahead of him in pairs to all the towns and places that he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. He said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. I mean, that's real encouraging, isn't it? Lambs and wolves, they don't get along. (laughs) Wolves eat lambs. And he's sending us out as if we're lambs among people that are going to eat us and destroy us. And his instructions are even more interesting. He goes on and says, don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Whenever you enter someone's home, first say, may God's peace be on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they're not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. But if a town refuses to welcome you, go out in its streets and say, we wipe even the dust of your town from our feet so that you may be abandoned to your fate. And know this, the kingdom of God is near. So we see there, Jesus is sending out his followers as sheep among wolves to carry out a mission. We have that same mission. We are sent, I believe this tells us, that we are sent by Jesus to bless people, to bring healing, and to announce that the kingdom of God is within reach of all people. That mission calls for far more from us than simply opening our doors to the church and saying, y'all come. It calls for us to enter into our community and world and to go places and do things that might be scary to us, to go in unknown territory. It calls us to enter into a relationship with people that we don't know and maybe who aren't like us. The mission of Jesus involves, if you will, risking together. That's our core value for today, risking together. Risking together is beautiful, and it's necessary for the mission of Jesus to spread in our world. Perhaps no place in all of Scripture do we see it more beautifully or powerfully done than in the book of Acts. A little bit of history to the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the early church. It's the followers of Jesus after Jesus has been killed, put in the grave, come back to life, encountered them several times, taught them a little bit, given them the power of the Holy Spirit, and then gone off to heaven to be with God forever, leaving behind the Holy Spirit. We see the power of the church on mission for Jesus in Acts in beautiful ways. Now, right prior to where Pastor Sharon started this morning in Acts 4, we see John and Peter on their way to the temple. They're going to worship. They're going to teach and preach in the temple about Jesus. And on their way to the temple, they go through the gate, the temple gate, and beside the gate lays a 40-year-old man who's crippled, who has friends that bring him there every day to lay beside the gate so that he can beg for money, to eat, and to exist. And so they're walking through this gate, and this beggar looks up to them and says, hey, puts out his hand, can you give me some money? And Peter and John stop, and Peter looks at the man and says, look at us. And the man looks, and I can imagine he's expecting that he's going to get something, some money. And Peter says to the man, we don't have any money, 
But what we have, we'll give you. And he reaches down, and he picks up the man, grabs hold of the man's hand, and he pulls him to his feet. The first time ever in his life, he stood on his feet. And he says, we don't have any money, but what we have in the name of Jesus, stand up and be healed. And the guy stands up and is healed, and he starts walking, and he starts jumping, and he starts praising God. And he goes into the temple, and everybody who's in the temple sees him praising God and jumping and walking. And they know who he is because they've walked by him every day in and out of the temple. There's no question. They knew he couldn't walk. They've seen his friends carry him there and place him beside the gate. And so the religious leaders get angry and they want to know what in the world is going on. In whose name are you doing this? And Peter and John explain it's in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and by the power of Jesus that they're doing this marvelous work. And the religious leaders are threatened. Whoa, whoa, we can't have that. Our jobs are on the line. It'll get out of control real quick. We got to stop that. So they put John and Peter in jail. And they think that's going to stop it. And that's where we pick up in chapter 4. Peter and John have been in jail, and they've been set free. And they're back in the temple after having been told not to teach or preach about Jesus or to heal in his name. Peter and John are speaking to the people. They were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people through Jesus that there is a resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them. And since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. The next day, the council of the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Uh, the storms are brewing. Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, By what power and whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? <laughs> I just love their boldness. Let me clearly state to all of you and to all people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chambers and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men, they asked. We can't deny that they performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak in the name or teach the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling everyone what we have seen and heard. I mean, that's our calling, to tell people what we've seen and heard, what we've experienced. The council then threatened them further, and they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. As soon as they were freed, I just, I, I just absolutely love the boldness of Peter and John. Get this. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together to 
in prayer to God and said, O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were these nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas and Pontius Pilate, the governor, and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And get this, here's the bold part. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and help us to hide. No. Hear their threats and give your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. If we're going to risk together, brothers and sisters, we have to learn to pray bold prayers. Risking together involves boldness and obedience. And when we are bold and we're obeying God, we will be fueled by the Holy Spirit. When we experience resistance and pushback because we're on mission for Jesus, when we're following Jesus, we need to learn how to issue bold prayers, to pray bold prayers. Because risking together involves staying connected to Jesus. That's what they're asking in their bold prayer. They're asking that Jesus would work in them and through them in powerful ways as they do the work that he has sent them to do. That's why always Jesus is our first core value because all that we're about, all that we do, it's not, it's not to make us great in this community or great in this world. It's not to make us anything. It's to make Jesus known. It's always about Jesus, always Jesus. It's our first core value. All that we do, all that we're about as a congregation, all that we're praying boldly to see happen is to, to lift Jesus up to make him known, to invite others in to a relationship with him that will change their life forever. Risking together is about relationship. It's about entering relationship with Jesus and entering relationship with other people and sharing the love that Jesus has given to us so that people can see the love that Jesus has for them and the power that he can unleash in their life as he meets them where they are and takes them where he wants them to go. So we see the apostles risking together for Jesus. And after being told to stop teaching and healing, there they are, healing and teaching in the name of Jesus, performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And crowds are coming, no wonder. And the religious leaders are jealous and angry, and they throw them back in jail. But God delivers them. God sent an angel, Luke tells us in Acts, and took them out of the jail and took them where? To the temple to teach and preach in the name of Jesus. And when the jailers came to get them, to bring them to the religious leaders for their next trial, they weren't there. And they went running to the temple and they found them teaching and preaching, doing exactly what they were told not to do. And there they were confronted by the religious leaders and Peter proclaimed, we must obey God rather than human authority. You see, brothers and sisters, risking together involves boldness. It involves obedience. It involves bold prayers. It involves keeping connected to Jesus. It involves being filled with the Holy Spirit, obeying God by doing what he reveals. Now, you know as well as I do, when we follow God in uh, a direction, he doesn't give us a map and say, okay, in 15 years, this is where you're going to be, and this is all that you're going to go through. He gives us a, a, a little bit of a, a, a clue and a, a direction that we're to go, and we go in that direction until we can't see anymore, and then we wait, and then he gives us another clue, and we go in that direction, and we just keep following the clues or the nudges 
by the Holy Spirit until we end up where God wants us. And when we go in the wrong direction, God shuts down the doors and, and tries to redirect us. We pick up the story in probably my favorite place in this whole book of Acts, in what I call the Gamaliel Principle. In chapter 5, verse 29, let me pick it up there. But Peter and the apostles replied, after they're being grilled by the religious leaders for yet another time, uh, we must obey God rather than human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as a prince and savior. He did this so that the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. When they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. But one member of the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in the religious law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be sent outside the council chamber for a while. And then he said to his colleagues, the council, the religious leaders, the religious authorities of the day, Men of Israel, take care what you are planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow Theodos who pre pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed and all his followers went various ways. He's, he's reminding them of someone who tried to be a great influence in that community and it ended up being for nothing because it wasn't of God. And then he says, and after him at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He taught people... Uh, he got people to follow him, but he was killed too. And all of his followers scattered. And here it is. So my advice is to leave these men alone. Let them go. If they're planning on doing things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You, will, you may even find yourself fighting against God, the chameleon principle. If it's of human origin, it will fail. But if God's behind it, it will succeed. You can't stop it. If we're going to risk together, brothers and sisters, we have to become well acquainted with this principle. Because if we do things that are risky together and God is guiding us in that direction, look out. Amazing things happen in our lives and through our lives and in the world. It goes on and says, those, uh, the others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles, had them flogged. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're angry that they can't do any more than that. So they beat them up and then they order them never again to speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. Who says following Jesus is for the faint of heart? We have to risk together. And I just love this. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Every day. I mean, after being put in jail several times, being flogged and beaten up, being ordered never to preach and teach in Jesus' name, they continued to risk together for the sake of Jesus and for the mission of Jesus in the world. It's a beautiful thing, brothers and sisters, when we can risk together for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of expanding his kingdom, inviting people to live as image bearers of God. Eleven years ago, when we bought this facility, that's what it looked like. We stepped out in faith, taking a risk to buy this place. That's where you're sitting. You're sitting in that place. It was a huge risk for this congregation to do that, to buy it and then spend $70,000 remodeling it, ripping out the pews so that we could become a homeless men's shelter 
Who would have imagined 11 years ago when we did that where we would go and what we would do? Think of what's happened in those years because of our willingness to be obedient to God's call in our lives, to turn our space that he had given us into a place of refuge for those who are broken. The Corner Church Collective formed. In the last eight years, four very different churches have been working together in beautiful ways, in ways that don't typically happen in our world. We've been working together as a shelter because we needed Bethany Lutheran. We needed their facility. We needed their kitchen. We needed their fellowship hall. And then they invited Beacon of Light. And then they invited the Restoration Project. And together, we've been doing amazing things for Jesus. And surely God smiles when churches work together. And then we did a garden. And then we've been, uh, well, that's what we did when we ripped the pews out. Uh, what it looked like in here. Then we did a garden, and then we've been a part of instigating this community center. I mean, who would have thought when we bought this property, if we had left it, <laughs> um, if we had left it like that, who knows what would be? We may not even be here today. But because we've been obedient and been praying bold prayers and following Christ where he leads us, ripping out the pews, opening our facility as a homeless shelter, and then having a audacity to leave our facility and, and work at a community garden and something that's leading to the instigation of, and I'm told it's going to be open uh, the end of the school year, the beginning of summer, a community um, community center in the neighborhood right across the street from the garden. And then when our facility was too small to host all the guests that God provided, we, we leased two other places. We leased the Langler Memorial Building from the Wicomico Presbyterian Church. And this year we leased that warehouse so that we could house up to 40 guys because we didn't want to tell 20 that they couldn't have a place in our facility. And you know what happened when we stepped out and we did that? It didn't cost us a penny more than it would have cost us here. God provided. God provided grants that took care of the $600 that we paid the Presbyterians to lease the Langler Memorial Building for those two weeks, 300 a week. And God provided the $1,000 that it cost us this year and the $2,000 in in heating fuel, I mean, we don't spend near that much to, to house the guys here, but God provided all of that. And that's what happens when we follow God, when we, when we risk together. God not only leads us, but he provides for us for what we need in the places that we're going. Four years ago, when we risked and moved out of our building into the garden, who knew? what would come. Countless lives have been touched by the love of Jesus shared in tangible ways. Risking together, brothers and sisters, involves boldness, obedience, bold praying, keeping connected to Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, doing what God reveals and waiting until he reveals the next step and watching God work in powerful ways. And I sense this morning that we are, or I sense in recent weeks that we're on the verge of another move of God, another great way. And it, the timing of this risking together is really good, as God always is. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I told you that we were working on a plan to buy that facility where we host, hosted the shelter this year. And I don't know how that's all going to play out. And I don't know if it's going to be that facility. And I don't really care. But I, I sense that God is leading us to take some risks and to risk together and to be bold and to pray boldly. Um, I told you a couple weeks ago that our neighbors were probably going to be buying that facility and using half of it as a church and offering the other half as a shelter. I'm not sure that's going to happen. I'm not sure that they're in agreement related to that, and uh, and that's okay. 
Um, I don't want to cause conflict or dissension in a congregation because of something that God's calling us to do. And I, I didn't really want to be involved in this at all. Um, I don't feel God calling me necessarily to start this shelter because I'm not leaving the garden, but God's been calling Walter to do it. And Walter and I have been working together and I'm going to fan his flames. And I learned a long time ago that when God calls you, you can't say no. You have to go through the doors that he opens. And if you don't go through the doors that God opens, God starts to shut them down. And so I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm inviting you to pray bold prayers that it goes somewhere. And I believe that it is going somewhere, and I believe that it's all connected to the garden. And it's all connected to when we came here and we tore out the pews and we opened our facility as a homeless shelter. It's all That's all interwoven together. And um, the, the, the new dream would be, and it doesn't involve that place because there's no property for it, but to find a place that has enough space that we can do some gardening so that we can grow vegetables to serve in the shelter. We can teach the skill of growing vegetables, and we can maybe even have some vegetables to sell as a way of sustaining because running a shelter is very expensive. I also know that on Monday, uh, I'm meeting with the um, the head person of the Governor's Office of Community Initiatives here in Salisbury. A friend, a mutual friend introduced us, and he wanted to meet. And I, I have some questions because there's a place called Poplar Hill Pre-Release down on Nanticoke Road. The state owns it. It's currently empty. I don't know what the state's doing with it. It's got lots of acreage. It has buildings. It would be a nice place. And I've been stirring around and asking questions of that. And so I intend to ask on Monday what the deal is. I have no idea. I had one person tell me it's it's just temporarily vacant. Uh, and I had other people tell me that it's uh, it's probably permanently vacant. And if we just let it be, it'll stay permanently vacant. And so my question is, what's what's the purpose of it? What 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 are we doing? Wouldn't it be neat if the church would lease it to if the state would lease it to a collective of churches for a dollar a year, and we could see a whole bunch of churches working together beyond just the four of us? I mean, there's 15 or 20 churches that are working together in the CESP shelter, and I've emailed all of them, and they're all on board with doing something in a central location. And if we do something in a central location, not in our individual buildings, it causes us to have to work together in a way that's beautiful, in a way that makes God smile, in a way that is far beyond what happens when we just stay in our little silos. I have no idea, brothers and sisters, and it scares me terribly to even think about moving in that direction. But here's what I know. I know that when we risk together and we pray bold prayers, that God provides for what he's calling us to do. And God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And so I have every confidence that however this plays out, and I'm not telling you how it's going to play out. I'm just saying we're going as far as we can see until we can't see. And then we're waiting on God to reveal the next steps. And I'm just wanting you to be involved in this process because it's part of our core values and because we need to be praying boldly that God would provide and work in huge ways. And I know that God is working in huge ways because uh, we're being invited into these arenas to talk about these issues. Thursday night, I was at Salisbury University. I was on stage with three other people from our community to talk about the church's response to homelessness. I had a I had I was given five to seven minutes to to get it get it all in there and that was a hard task. I did take some pictures and pictures are worth a thousand words and so you know I was able to show some things um, and I didn't have I didn't take the liberty that the dean of students took and take twice the time. <laughs> Halfway through, I was thinking, man, he's getting a lot in. And I looked down at the timekeeper's time and it was at eleven minutes at that point. <laughs> I'm like. Ah, now I know. But, you know, it's just amazing the places that we get to go when we risk together and we pray bold play prayers and follow God. We must risk together for Jesus, brothers and sisters, trusting that if God is in it, it can't be stopped. 